Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you especially for being indoors, where my temptation would have been to be outdoors with the revelers on the lakefront. But I'll try to keep uh, this brief and hopefully interesting uh, in terms of sort of telling you what evolutionary biology can tell us in terms of an archaeological record of uh, viral invasions into the human genome. So uh, this is a picture of uh, Ramses V, um, the mummified head of Ramses V, who died in 1157 BC, clearly indicating that Ramses V was exposed to the smallpox virus. Now, we don't really know whether he died of smallpox, although that's the common speculation in uh, other parts of the world. But it was very clear that even as early as 1157, smallpox was actually ravaging parts of uh, northern Africa, at least. So uh, there are a number of other viruses that are actually currently ravaging the human species. And the one that we can sort of think about in the most dramatic terms is the pandemic of HIV, which causes the AIDS epidemic. And you can see that there are parts of the world that are profoundly affected by the AIDS epidemic. There are uh, parts of sub-Saharan Africa where uh, uh, there's a one in three chance that you're HIV positive, basically, for broad swaths of the population. And so it's very, very important for us to consider what kind of therapies can do to avoid massive extinction events. And the good news is that antiretroviral therapy, which sort of took a while to get going in terms of uh, uh, funding, et cetera, at least scientifically seems to be working. Now there appears to be more of a political will needed in order to sort of devote the ne energies necessary to suppress this epidemic. So what is interesting about this particular virus and this spread across the globe, and a little sobering is we know for a fact that this virus has not been present in humans for more than 100 years. So this virus jumped at one point, uh, we believe very close to the Congo. We believe that the epicenter of the jump from chimpanzees to humans was in Kinshasa in, in the Congo Republic. And you can basically see how dramatically this particular pandemic has taken off. Now, what you don't uh, sort of hear about in the popular press is actually there have been eight separate jumps of retroviruses from either chimps or gorillas into humans. And only one of these pandemics has really taken off. So if you even simply focus on the pandemics that have dramatically affected human species, if you sort of look at historical records, you can sort of uh, identify, this is sort of a rogues gallery of uh, viruses that in historical terms has dramatically affected human population. So we basically have very early on smallpox, measles, which is the dramatic fatalities associated with that. Somewhere in here should also be the 1918 flu epidemic and even earlier flu epidemics that again wiped out large population swaths as they were being infected um, and quarantined basically against these viruses. Uh, HIV is a relatively young virus. Even younger viruses, the SARS epidemic, how many of you remember that? That sort of swept through. It's a coronavirus that uh, basically was the most dramatic scare uh, prior to the uh, swine flu scare that we had a couple of years ago. But today's uh, talk is actually going to be focused on a different class of viruses. These are viruses that we don't really hear about in our history books, except if you look at a different kind of history books, which is our own DNA. And so these are viruses that have actually left fossil records in the human genome. So your own genome, your own DNA, is a living testament to its assault from previous viruses. And you can basically reconstruct a wonderful history of these past viral invasions. Uh, wonderful if you're an evolutionary biologist, sobering if you're a human being, um, uh, about how many viruses are basically infiltrated and sort of laid residence into the human genome. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. So the reason we have this wonderful fossil record is because retroviruses are sort of a special class of viruses. I should have mentioned HIV-1 is a retrovirus. But retroviruses, as part of their life cycle, they enter the cell. They go through a process of reverse transcription. They get transported to the cell's nucleus. And then they integrate, leaving an imprint of their own genome into the host DNA. And this imprint is then used to make more copies of the virus than as it buds off. So this is an obligate step of a retroviral life cycle. That means if it infects a cell for a successful infection, it needs to leave an imprint in the host DNA. So most of the time, this happens in any sort of cell, maybe a blood cell in the body. And so we've got here now an exogenous or an infectious virus that is infecting koalas. And these koalas will then transmit it to other koalas, et cetera. But just occasionally, this virus can then infect the cells the stem cells that will produce 
offspring. So these are the cells that will go on to produce eggs and sperm. And so now these are imprints that are being transmitted, not just by infection, but being passed on from mom to her offspring. So this is a case where the virus has now left an imprint in the genome that has become passed on from uh, parent to offspring. This is now part of the koala genome heritage, basically. And it will be passed on essentially from that point on, as far as that lineage lives. Uh, I'm particularly fond of koalas, but the reason I use this as an example is because this is an example of a virus entering the koala genome that we've been successful at catching in the act. So about 100 years ago, uh, the koala populations in Australia were sort of separated into these geographical islands. Uh, these are not literally islands, but these are populations that are sort of separated from each other, including one literal island on Kangaroo Island. And as uh, researchers came very recently and sort of sampled, they realized that these koalas were displaying some sort of AIDS-like epidemic. Um, and they sort of tracked down that virus to a completely different retrovirus that infected a lot of koalas in uh, northeast Australia. And as they went down, they realized not only was this virus infecting these koalas, this was now being passed on from parent to offspring. This was now part of the koala genome in northeast uh, Australia, yet there were parts of Australia that were completely immune. So in the space of 100 years, we are basically catching this virus, becoming part of at least these koalas' genetic heritage just in the act. Uh, if you take a look at the human genome or a primate genome, uh, the koala example is basically just one example of the multitude of infections that have happened in the course of evolution. So most of my talk today, I'm going to be focusing on a period between 35 to 45 million years ago, which is the separation of New World monkeys that are usually found in Central and South America, Old World monkeys typically found in Asia and Africa, and hominoids, including us, which have basically been sort of separated for about 6 million years at least from our closest relatives. What these big arrows indicate are massive episodes <laughs> of retroviral insertions that we can decipher happened at this particular time in evolution. The reason we can decipher that these viruses entered the uh, genome here and not here is because every primate descended from that particular lineage carries exactly those imprints. So when I say they're carrying exactly those imprints, this is literally like driving a car into a parking space and parking within one millimeter. So if you basically come Monday through Friday and watch that car in exactly the same space, chances are very likely that car hasn't moved rather than you've managed to successfully park yourself in exactly the same spot over and over. And what we actually have here are 100,000 cases of these sort of perfect uh, symmetries of uh, inheritance of these retroviral imprints as they go through, perfectly consistent with each other and with the fossil record of primate evolution. So we estimate there are at least 100,000 such individual fossilized viruses uh, present and decipherable in the human genome. What is remarkable is that these came from at least 31 different classes of viruses. So you can sort of imagine that in the 35 million year history that we can decipher here, we've had 100,000 viruses that not only infected us, infected our germline successfully and were passed on successfully from parent to offspring. So this, is, this reveals a dramatic history of these particular retroviral invasions into the human genome. This is 8% of the human genome. So some of you, so this is the glass full, half full, half empty argument. Some of you are saying, well, 8%, well, I still have 92%. Actually, you do not. Because if you look at the human genome as the hard drive, that contains all the software necessary to make a human being, the actual software that makes up a human being in terms of coding important protein or RNA information is between 1 and 3% of the genome. So we literally have en masse more viral DNA in our own DNA than something that makes us human. Um, if, if that sounds sort of astounding, keep in mind that I'm not even talking about this class of uh, selfish retrotransposable elements here the line one elements that easily by bulk make up more than 50% of our DNA. So literally we are basically a hard drive full, full of spam and other viruses, <laughs> some decrepit viruses, some present day viruses that have basically left an imprint. If this was a computer uh, sort of uh, hard drive, you would be taking it into the shop to get it completely cleaned out. 
because this is literally we're carrying a lot of this in our own genome. Uh, I'm actually going to tell you about one vignette of what these ancient viruses, just one of these fossilized versions, and what a dramatic impact it had in uh, evolution. So once again, we sort of want to introduce ourselves to the retroviral genome. It's made up of three genes in particular, a gag gene that essentially makes up the crystal lattice that uh, protects the virus. This is called the capsid, the proteinaceous coat that protects the viral genome. The pole gene that encodes all of the enzymatic machinery necessary for the virus to invade and essentially carry out its own replication. And this gene, in which I'm going to spend a lot of time for this talk, which is the on or envelope gene. And this is the gene that confers the infectious property onto the virus. This is a membrane-bound protein that will dock with cellular proteins that are called receptors and mediate a viral to cell fusion that essentially introduces the virus into a host cell. If you are mut mutant in this envelope protein, you are incapable of mediating an infection. So as I mentioned, this retroviral genome has integrated multiple times in the course of evolution. So what happens as you integrate over the course of evolution, however, is there's nothing to preserve this virus. So if this virus, say, entered 35 million years ago, you're basically going to acquire a random mutation that inactivates first one gene, then another gene, the third gene, and essentially you come back millions of late years later, what you have is basically a record of mutations that have occurred, because this is essentially a junk piece of DNA that the human genome doesn't care very much about, and so it's basically been allowed to abrade. In fact, the signature of mutations can tell us a lot, a confirmation about the age of the virus, because the longer the virus has been sitting in the human genome, the more mutations that we expect it would have acquired. Now, in the midst of this sort of expectation, and literally 99% of these viral fossils look like that. They're fossilized versions that have accumulated mutations. But Every once in a while, when you're looking at these 100,000 imprints, you come across something like this. So this is the virus imprint that essentially the entire viral genome has gone to hell, except for one part of the gene, which appears to have magically uh, protected itself from mutation, almost as if the primate genome was preserving a part of this retroviral genome for its own purpose. And so that's what my talk is about today. Why would you want to take this uh, infectious property of a virus and try to preserve it for your own good. So it turns out that there is a remarkable story of this sort of making lemonade out of lemons. So you now have this envelope gene from a very old virus 35 million years ago, and now this gene is called syncytin. It's basically a captive retroviral envelope protein. Syncytin has been preserved for 35 million years of primate evolution. This is essentially now a primate gene, very much working as any other gene in the human genome. Remarkably, it still retains the properties of its ancestry as a retrovirus, which means that if I take this envelope gene and substitute it for another virus, it can completely carry out infection. It's retained all of the function necessary to be a perfectly functional retroviral envelope gene. And what became a very important clue was it appears to be most abundantly expressed in one organ in particular, which is the placenta. So why would you basically take the infectious property of a retroviral envelope gene and essentially use it for some function in the placenta? It turns out that in the developing fetus, there is a stage, I hope not, nobody's pregnant in this room, um, uh, where the fetus essentially sends off cells that need to infiltrate into the mom's body such that it can acquire nutrients through the mom's bloodstream. And remarkably, the process by which the fetus is able to infiltrate into mom's body is exactly the same process by which the virus invades into the cell. So what primates have done is essentially harness the cell-cell fusion properties of a virus to basically now make it useful for the developing fetus to now acquire nutrients in, from mom. Any questions? <laughs> so this is great. 35 million years ago, we happened to steal a retroviral envelope gene in some primates, and now we use it for some sort of placental function. This leaves a number of questions. First of all, what did we do 35 million years previously? <laughs> 
Uh, you know, we've had placental sort of live birth for a while, and I hope to address that. Moreover, what do other mammals use? It turns out, if you look at rodents, rodents have also domesticated a completely different class of retroviral envelope gene for the same function, where they also now have taken the source retrovirus that happened to integrate into a rodent genome completely by happenstance, and now they preserve the envelope gene, whereas the rest of the retroviral genome has basically become completely decrepit. Now, the advantage of this rodent case, however, is uh, we can actually do genetics. So what scientists have done, especially Terry Heidman, who's in France and one of the leaders in this field, is take this syncytin gene from a mouse and delete it genetically, and then ask, what is the outcome of this deletion? It turns out that if you are mutant, if you're a mutant uh, with both copies of this gene missing in a fetus, that fetus cannot develop completely. It cannot make a proper placenta. It cannot be carried to term. If you are not mutant, you're perfectly functional. Moreover, if you're a mom, if you can genetically engineer uh, who is uh, basically engineered to lose her syncytin function, it doesn't matter. It needs to come in from the fetus. It's necessary for the fetus to, uh, to get nutrition at the right amounts and at, at the right influx. So this proves basically that this very young syncytin gene in the mouse genome in particular has been used now for this important placental function, this important development that has allowed the, uh, mice to essentially carry babies uh, in terms of placental birth. So I kind of want to summarize what we've done sort of over uh, multiple years now. So if you sort of simply summarize all the mammals that we currently know express these domesticated retroviral envelope genes in their placenta. So we've already covered primates. Every simian primate, so 35 million years of primate evolution, all of us <laughs> express syncytin genes in our placenta. Every rodent that has been looked at expresses a syncytin gene in the placenta. Important to note, this retrovirus is completely different from this retrovirus. We've looked at sheep and goats, and they have a syncytin gene expressed in their placenta. Now, this particular case is very interesting because this is still present. The retrovirus is still present as an infectious retrovirus. So here's a case where the retrovirus is causing pathogenesis, but it's also necessary, or a relative is necessary for basically carrying out placental function. And most recently, we've looked at rabbits and hares, and they also have a syncytin gene. Now, again, I'm just sort of emphasizing each of these retroviruses is completely different. The only property that is shared is that their envelope gene became this very useful property for the host genome to usurp. So leading to the suggestion that for millions of years, we've basically been trading in on envelope genes for placental function, replacing them with newer and better versions of these viral cell fusion machineries in order to carry out this very essential role in development. So, so I, at least I hope some of you are scratching, well, this sounds kind of weird. And I agree completely. It is kind of weird, except when you sort of realize that in the course of evolution, mammals made a very, very dramatic transition that most animals have not made. So uh, very, very early in evolution, so if you, here we have chicken and other birds, which, are, uh, as we all know, are egg-laying. The mammalian lineage split off into two. We have us over here, along with the other sort of relatives, including marsupials kangaroos and opossum. And then we have this early diverging lineage, this lineage that split off from the rest of the mammals called the monotremes. So who can name a monotreme? Platypus. platypus the, so why are platypus so unique in the ma mammalian kingdom? Why are monotremes so unique? Well, because they're still egg-laying. These are mammals that are perfectly egg-laying. They have features that are intermediate between other mammals for instance, they also do lactation, so they can sort of breastfeed their kids, but they also have features that are in common with birds in the sense that they are egg-laying. Remarkably, if we look in our own genomes, these other mammals have genes associated with egg-laying, but now these genes have become decrepit, like those retroviral fossils, because they're no longer in use. So this is our history of egg-laying essentially trapped into our own genome as a historical record. So this is this remarkable uh, story where it sort of it 
leads one to ponder whether this very, very important transition from egg laying to live birth essentially predicated on the happenstance of a retrovirus that happened to insert into this mammalian ins uh, ancestor more than 180 million years ago. And what we've been doing for those 180 million years, essentially trading in our envelope genes for placental function, replacing them with newer, shinier versions, if you will, of uh, current day versions of uh, retroviral envelopes. So I, I just sort of want, this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of science we do. So uh, I just want to sort of leave you with the impression there are at least four uh, active genes uh, that are envelope origin from retroviruses preserved in the human genome. We only know that two of them function in the placenta for, for the function that I just described. The other two, we have no idea why they're still preserved. And so they're clearly doing something important because they've been around for about 35 million years. Uh, until recently, it was believed that only retroviruses have left a really good fossil record. And that's because this is an obligate form of the obligate part of the retroviral life cycle. But evolution sort of totally uh, works on chance as well. So here we have a whole battery of other ret uh, viruses, non-retroviruses, that happen to have left an imprint in the genome. I'll just blow up here to, again, get a rogues gallery of things that have affected us. So for instance, we have Borna viruses, uh, filoviruses. So filoviruses are basically the class of viruses that includes Ebola. In fact, the filoviral remnant in our own genome is one of the closest neighbors to the present-day Ebola virus that we know of. So why, why is this kind of study important? It tells us two things. First, it tells us that these viruses are not new. Some of these viruses date back hundreds of millions of years. The second thing it tells us is that our ancestors actually encountered these viruses because these viruses left this imprint and obviously survived that imprint. And we'd like to understand the genetic basis by, by which these uh, genomes were able to uh, overcome the challenges imposed by these viruses. I'll finally sort of leave you with the sort of interesting and recent finding that some of these Borna virus genes are being preserved in the genome just the same as syncytin was preserved from the retroviral envelope gene. So it's actually a very interesting question to consider how much of our fundamental current biology is being shaped by these happenstance instances of viruses introduced, sampled, and now domesticated by these primate genomes. So I'm going to end my uh, talk there. I, I hope this is provocative enough that I'll get questions. Remember, you're being taped, so no swearing. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank my colleague, Mike Emmerman, who's an HIV virologist, and I'm an evolutionary biologist, and we actually uh, bounce off lots of ideas of each other. This is my lab at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. The other part of my lab is very interested in uh, the potential identification of unknown viruses that might be associated with uh, etiology of disease. And I'm going to leave this slide up here uh, that tells you about other science seminars that are held at the Hutch, if you guys are interested. There are also some remarkable educational opportunities. If you know a really a talented high schooler between uh, uh, sophomore and senior years in high school, there's an opportunity to work in a lab over a summer and acquire real uh, experience. And there's other events at the Hutch, and we have a flyer at the back about how you could sort of see other types of science that's being done at the Hutch. So thanks very much. Are you doing this because it's just good basic research, or do you think there might be some connection between this science and the cure for cancer? So both. Uh, so my interest in this uh, is uh, primarily from a basic sciences perspective, sort of trying to understand fundamental questions in biology. So I'm an evolutionary biologist. But it turns out that each of these uh, viral genes has sort of a dark side to it. So for instance, the two syncytin genes that I sort of I only talked about one in detail are also believed to be prime candidates for triggers that cause autoimmune disease, especially in the neurological. Uh, so syncytin 1 has been implicated by mechanisms we don't fully understand to trigger an autoimmune reaction because this is sort of a highly immunogenic protein that the immune system sort of instantly recognizes something that doesn't really belong, even though it's a human gene now. And that trigger essentially starts a cascade of a hyperimmune reactivity that ends up costing myelin sheets on axonal uh, uh, branches. These are myelin sheets that 
you need for basically transmitting uh, neuronal signals with maximum fidelity. And when the immune system starts attacking the myelin sheets, uh, that can manifest into uh, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. So that's just one example of uh, the biomedical side of things. I didn't, I didn't talk about this in more detail, but there's a lot of these vignettes of uh, retroviral genes and we are actually learning a lot of very important lessons about how host genes overcame these viral genes. Because not only are these retroviral fossils trapped in our genome, but in the evolution of the host antiviral genes, we've actually trapped the successful evolutionary strategy. And so uh, in a previous Science on Tap talk, I actually talked about one of these strategies that we've been able to decipher where an antiviral gene learned to defeat a very pandemic-like retrovirus that infected chimps and gorillas, but not humans. And we were able to essentially understand what was the amino acid, the single residue, the single bit of information that changed in the antiviral gene that allowed you to protect against this ancient, now extinct retrovirus. In this uh, instance, it also turns out that the same amino acid that protected us against the old retrovirus now makes us more susceptible to a younger retrovirus like HIV-1. So there's this trade-off between you sort of adapting to one virus and losing your adaptability to a second virus. And so uh, the biomedical, my uh, experience has taught me that if you focus on the basic research, the biomedical uh, research is just, uh, it comes naturally. Yeah. I got a simple basic question. If if somebody who's infected with a retrovirus pass it on to the offspring, isn't the baby born with the virus in every cell in their body? and Or does it somehow get disabled? Or does their immune system also go better? Or it's like... So, uh, so lots of things can happen. What ends up happening is that if you've successfully transmitted the viral genome, that viral genome happens to be silenced, except in those tissues that help the virus propagate to the next generation, which is the next generation of the stem cells that give produce to eggs and sperm. So the virus is actually only seen in a subset of cells, even though the viral genome, the, the ability to make the virus, is present in every cell. So this is a strategy that's been honed over millions of years by the virus, because if the virus ends up killing all the hosts that it's transmitted to early, it's not going to be a successful pathogen. That's right. You had mentioned that the uh, sheep um, still had negative repercussions from the retrovirus that it carries, as well as the positive um, attributes of it. Is that something that you expect will eventually, the sheep will eventually get over the negative part, or how does that Yeah, so, so this, the sheep virus is actually called Yaxi sheep retrovirus. It's actually a very nasty virus you sort of infect through... Uh, uh, so through snot, basically. So you basically in, uh, infect other sheep um, by nuzzling. And it turns out that the uh, viruses that have entered the genome have two positive outcomes to sheep. So sheep that have this virus integrated can actually train their immune system to recognize and cleanse this virus because the cells are making parts of the protein from the virus that essentially trains the immune system to now recognize. It's almost like getting vaccinated. Uh, against the virus. The second outcome is actually the placental function. So over time, this integration event might actually accelerate the cleansing of the virus from the population, just as this vaccination strategy. I was trying to think about w how this retrovirus would first get introduced into the population. So would it take time to slowly work through the population to the point where it could then become passed on? Or is the thought maybe that the retrovirus w itself went through a, a mutation at some point where it became, it jumped and may would have rapidly um, infected the population? I guess I'm trying to think about how does it start to the point where it can become passed on as part of the gene structure? That's a very good question. So in terms of its evolutionary long-term success, uh, 
the virus is most in peril at the early stages because you can lose it just by chance, essentially. It's like drawing marbles out of a bag and moving them to another bag. If, you're, if you happen to be a person who passed on more genes that happen to not be infected with the virus, you could see that just by chance you might sort of... The way we view these multiple viral imprints, and many of them are made like, almost like a machine gun, you know, many independent viral imprints made by the same virus in this very short time frame, we think that the virus was almost certainly originated as a zoonotic transmission uh, from a related species or from a completely unrelated species. And if the species lived in close proximity, the chances of a repeated zoonotic transmission was higher. Nonetheless, your main question is still a very good one, which is it takes a lot of small probabilities to overcome for the virus to actually be successfully transmitted and now make it to all the members of that particular species. As you can see in the koala case, it's a very good catching it in the act because it's clearly been successful at transmitting itself and now it's in all species that are populating northeast Australia, but in none of the species that are populating you know, so southern Australia. And so the thinking is that what we've caught it is in the act of basically sweeping through 40, 50 years from now this particular virus is probably going to be completely endemic in the koala genomes. Does that answer your question? Sorry, I don't know to say this, but um, is the virus successful because it's infiltrated and continued through progeny and, and changed and mutated in order to keep the host alive, or is it is it kind of had to change its success rate? by allowing the host to, to live and not cause the damage it originally did? So that's a very good question. And uh, I have to be careful to not let my own bias sort of answer that question because there's two ways to view that. One way is that the virus is ensuring its own uh, success through the transmission of its genes. Made even more basal, it's actually the genes of the virus that are more successful. The virus itself, I think, loses the battle by integration, essentially because Every imprint it, means it makes in the host genome is a dead end. That particular virus might make more progeny, but it's, sit, it's a sitting duck for mutation. The longer it sits in the genome, the more likely it is to going to get. So the only successful strategy for a pathogen like a virus or even a retrotransposable element that's a genomic parasite is to make more copies. As soon as it stops doing that, it's essentially an evolutionary dead end. Um, so a lot of people, including me, think that when the virus leaves an imprint, it's got this quasi-state where the infectious particle is, in fact, a virus. But the provirus, this integrated version of the virus in the host genome, is now, for all practical purposes, a host gene. So in, in a way, the virus is leaving behind this evolutionary history of uh, police officers, if you will, that might actually one day come back to haunt the virus. And we actually have multiple instances. One really spectacular example is, again, from the mouse genome, where a... Uh, so I talked about envelope genes in my talk, but there's a version of a gag gene that was domesticated. And it turns out that my species that successfully domesticated this gag gene called FV1 used the same gene to defeat all the viruses that carry related gag genes. So they've basically stolen the gene that allows them to now kill the viral infection in its tracks. So again, now this gene is now a host gene in every respect including in sort of this anthropomorphized version of what we think about as viral or host genes. So the virus got lazy. So the, so the virus needs to keep up, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, you halfway answered this. So if um, viruses that we've encountered in the past, like you mentioned about Ebola, is it a new virus that we're encountering now, or is it something that we became immune to through um, contact before and it's it has mutated as well. So uh, that's again a very good question. Uh, we tend to think about viruses in terms of these lineages, and so the lineage of filoviruses or Ebola-like viruses that infected us millions of years ago is believed to be a separate lineage. So it's distinct enough that we would consider the present-day Ebola virus a different virus. Uh, but that's not true across the board. There are certainly younger viruses that uh, entered our genome, you know, less than 10 million years ago that might have remnants still floating around that are different enough that they can overcome whatever infectious strategy, anti-infectious strategy we came up with uh, 
but are not so dramatic that we would consider them completely different images. So the best way to think about this is uh, it's kind of like this rock, paper, scissors game, right? So the host comes up with a strategy. The virus can only succeed if it overcomes that strategy. Now it starts infecting the host again. Now the only way the host can survive is if it overcomes. And so what we can basically track in the course of evolution is these repeated changes of rock, paper, scissors games at the level of individual bits of information in their protein and then use that to actually reconstruct these evolutionary games as they happen. These are high stakes games, but the rules are the same as playing you know, rock, paper, scissors. Yes? Uh, <clears throat> if there was, let's say, a sheep in America and then a sheep in um, Ireland, would there be any difference with the way they react to the protein or Whatever it's called, I forget. Virus? Retrovirus, yeah. Uh, almost certainly they would, and that would have to be uh, because of the underlying genetics. So the sheep have this uh, immune system that protects them against uh, viral infections, and you know if these sheep have been isolated or separated for long enough, uh, which sheep in Africa have been, for instance, from Europe and America, sheep in America are actually very closely related to those from Ireland. Um, then we would basically argue that, yes, that they would be different. Now, I think what you're getting at is whether if you're, if you're a sheep population that was uh, infected by a virus, would your genome now look different from a sheep that didn't get infected by the virus? And I think the answer to that is yes. Very much like the koalas that I mentioned, where some koalas that have been infected now actually have these viruses in their genome, in their DNA, and other koalas that are, live on this uh, kangaroo island uh, are not infected, have never seen this particular virus, and completely remain free. Now, the question is, what will happen if they do encounter the virus? Let's say there's a koala that escapes and goes onto the island. Um, it's a very good question. Two things might happen. This koala might actually uh, successfully infect the rest of the population, in which case everybody is now infected, or this particular uh, island is isolated enough that that never happens. Yes? So is this a mode of speciation? Uh, not necessarily, because it's an asymmetric. It's essentially like a, a an, quote, adaptive gene sort of spreading through a species. There's no reproductive isolation here. Uh, and that's the reason why the virus is not impeded from its. The only thing that impedes it in this instance with the island population is geographical separation. Over time, of course, we know over millions of years, geographical uh, separation can lead to new species, but the virus itself is not the agent of the reproductive isolation. In, instead, actually, the virus ends up breaking down those kinds of barriers. Thanks. So, so I keep thinking about the spam and the hard drive analogy. Is the hard drive... Uh, fixed in its amount of storage space? And is this a sustainable situation that, you know, you were saying if, if uh, it was a computer hard drive, we'd be taking it in to get erased or get refreshed. Is, is, can you talk a little bit more about, because uh, the pie chart and that comment uh, lead me to lots of different conclusions if you sort of play that out you know, to the logical uh, consequences. Certainly. Uh, I think uh, I'll start off by saying that uh, the hard drive is not constant. So the, we know for a fact that the human genome is at least, uh, estimates vary, but between 15 to 20 percent larger than it was 30 million years ago. That's a remarkable rate of expansion. And it's almost all made up of these kinds of elements and the elements that I didn't talk about, these non-LTR elements. Now, that seems spectacular, but consider for a fact the maize genome, which after domestication, the maize went through this dramatic expansion where we think it doubled in size in the last six million years, completely as a result of this rampant expansion of these transposable elements or virus-like elements in the genome. So the, the genome size is not fixed. Now, what fixes it or what constrains it is selection. So the more DNA you have to replicate, which is really not replicating, essentially poses a selective burden on your cellular machinery. You're using up more 
uh, energy, you're using up more nucleotides every time. It's taking longer to replicate the genome. And so that constrains it, but the genome size per se is not constrained. The human genome is one of the sort of larger genomes that we know of in uh, eukaryotes or animals and plants, but by no means is it the largest. It's not even close. Uh, and the largest genomes essentially happen to be even fu fuller of spam, actually. So if you sort of button down to the software part, the part that actually makes the organism, the RNA and the proteins, actually it's remarkably conserved. You could actually say with some, some degree of uh, variance that a fruit fly software is comparable. It's about one, uh, one half the size of the uh, software of a human cell. What, what differs is that human genome is extremely inefficient at getting rid of spam, whereas the fruit fly genome is remarkably efficient. So as a result, the uh, human uh, genome is almost 25 times larger. Yes, question back. So you were saying that um, viruses mutate over time. So does that mean that they have an average lifespan that scientists have figured out? Yes, uh, they do. Uh, the lifespan varies significantly from whether they are in the midst of an infection or they are sort of, quote, in the wild, which means they can go many, many years before they actually jump from one organism to another in the wild. Um, so viruses vary. So, for instance, the flu virus is one of the fastest evolving viruses that we know of, which is, which is why every year we have to actually figure out the guessing game of which is the, going to be the flu virus that we're going to encounter next flu season, because there's the real possibility is going to look very different than it was a year ago. Um, HIV is also very rapidly evolving, but nowhere near as fast as the flu virus. And the rate of mutation is actually dictated by the uh, error rate of the machinery that makes more of the virus. It turns out that the flu virus actually benefits from this high error rate, which might seem sort of counterintuitive, because it essentially can escape faster from the immune system that is basically mounting a response. HIV can also do a very good job. There are other viruses that are much slower. So herpes viruses or pox viruses like smallpox evolve quite slowly. They rely on the host machinery. So they're basically relying on a much more high fidelity uh, mechanism of copying themselves. And so the, uh, the uh, generation time can vary many, many orders of magnitude depending on which virus and whether it's in the midst of an infection or whether it's basically just transmitted from one organism to the other. So that's one of the things these imprints have really allowed us to do because if you actually estimate generation times from something in the midst of an infection, we know from, from case studies that we can be actually off by a hundredfold. Whereas these fossilized versions, and essentially since we know so much about how these host genomes have diverged based on the fossil record, we get a much, much better sense of the mutation rates and the generation times of these viruses. So you mentioned that uh, roughly 8% of the human genome is um, fossils of these retroviruses. And I was just wondering if we knew how how, what percentage of that 8% is actually effective um, in our lives today and actually useful sequences as opposed to just junk DNA? Uh, so very good question. So of the 8%, so first of all, human uh, genome does not harbor any, quote, active retrovirus. So that's different from chimps and gorillas, for instance, where they actually have replication-competent viruses sometimes in their genome. Rhesus macaques have a lot of them in their genome. So, uh, so the last major virus invasion of the human genome, we estimate happened more than uh, 500,000 years ago, based on our dating. Uh, in terms of the question that you just asked, uh, you can sort of see from my cartoon example that the longer the virus has been in the genome, the more likely it is we can say with high certainty this is turning into junk. The shorter it has been in the genome, it might look like it's actually being preserved, but it's actually not. It's just basically not hit the right number of mutations for us to make a certainty. So because of that, we can actually not really comment on the last 500 to a million years of, uh, 500,000 to a million years of evolution. Those viral imprints have not acquired the right signatures for us to say whether they're on the way out or are they way in. For the ones that we can say, we estimate there are between 100 to 200 copies that even have any potential of encoding something like syncytin. 
So that's out of 100,000 copies. So it's a very small fraction. Just was kind of thinking, and this may call for speculation, that if evolution is not as smooth as I, you know, I understand most people that figure that it wasn't smooth, it was fits and starts, all of, there was sudden bursts. Is there a thought that it was the introduction of some new retrovirus that may have been a factor in that sudden burst? So first of all, speculation is my top speciality. It says before, on top of evolutionary biologists. So uh, there are a number of very famous biologists who have argued that retroviruses allow you to explore maybe an adaptive landscape, overcome some sort of challenge that you wouldn't. It's a little bit difficult from first principles to see how that might happen because it's essentially like uh, essentially taking a very, very, very poisonous entity and using it to essentially stir the pot. Uh, because these retroviruses have a very, very large uh, selective detriment based on when they insert in the genome. Now, there is a very, very small probability that one of those instances will give you an advantage, like Syncytin clearly did. But the bulk of these, so the 100,000 imprints we see are probably a very small fraction of the millions of imprints we should have seen, which were actually lost because they were actually deleterious. And so it's essentially like... Uh, almost like taking a shotgun to your genome and hoping for the one right spot. It's possible that will work, but it's a very low probability event. Now, that's not to say that it couldn't have happened. It clearly happened in this one instance, and it might have happened multiple times. But as an adaptive strategy, increasing your mutation rate is, is good for short-term, but not for a sort of long-term long survival uh, strategy. Uh, it's hard to imagine how this would play out over the generation time that uh, long-lived animals like us go through, it's easier to model those kinds of scenarios uh, in organisms like bacteria that also have viruses. And in, in the case of bacteria, having much of, having a higher load of these viruses can, in fact, give them an advantage uh, overcoming adaptive challenges. Any other questions? Um, in the case of the uh, four different classes of retroviruses that you found in the four different mammalian groups, is the sequence of the envelope gene on those four different viral um, classes pretty similar? Uh, that's a very good question. It's actually not very similar. So it turns out that of the three genes in retroviruses, the envelope gene is actually the most rapidly evolving. And that can make sense from two perspectives. One is that it might be the most free to evolve because the gag gene has to encode a particular structure and the enzymatic machinery is even more constrained. And secondly, the envelope gene is the only thing that the adaptive immune system, this, the antibodies and T cells, see. So they are in a very, very rapid escalator of mutation rates. As a result, the envelope genes are barely alignable. You can see some discernible features, but they all share the property that if you were to switch envelope genes between these four viruses, they'd all work perfectly. It's pretty modular. Yet the sequence is not necessarily conserved. It's the functional property that is. What's next? What's the next? What's next, yeah. You're not from my grant funding agency, are you? No, <laughs> Okay, just have to clarify. Uh, I think the, 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 as I said, we literally just scratched the tip of the iceberg. We know these beautiful stories about Syncytin 1 and 2, and yet the stories I didn't tell you are the ones that we actually don't know. So there are, as I said, there's two other retroviral envelope genes that are not expressed in the placenta. One of them might be expressed in the brain, one of them in the thymus. And then there's now this literally uh, smorgasbord of other viral genes that have been preserved. And it's really, I think we are literally at that stage where you can sort of dive in and figure out how much of what makes us human is actually of viral ancestry. I think we are right at that stage. We have a lot of sequences. The reason we can do this work and decipher these genes is because we have genome sequences not just from the human, you know, from humans, but also from a number of primates. We can know exactly when a particular viral, when exactly how long it's been preserved, 
And now we can actually use genetics to understand, as in the case of the mouse in Sidon, how important is this to the biology of the organism. And that's what I hope to really understand. I'm actually curious on the uh, process of coming up with this research. Like, what's the life of a, a, a graduate student who's uh, working on this? So uh, the story I described, uh, in all honesty, took about uh, 21 years to fully nail down. So that's several graduate theses. And uh, I was actually only involved in a part of this work. Uh, and, and Terry Heidman's lab actually did the lion's share of most of this work. And there were at least three or four really superb graduate students who took parts of the story. So establishing that since I didn't, in fact, has been preserved, this is not just a probabilistic thing, was one thesis in its own. Sequencing this gene from multitude of primates and showing that it's conserved. Showing that it has conserved its functional properties, it can be used, for instance, as a retroviral analog gene was another sort of big thesis. Uh, by far the biggest sort of breakthrough in terms of actually solidifying this was actually the genetic knockout of the mouse syncytin, and that was another sort of episode. So, so if you're sort of a graduate student starting off, you'd love to say, well, I'm going to figure this out, and that's how you hook your graduate students to come in and sort of do this work. But, but if they're pragmatic, they know that they're going to make several breakthroughs, and these are the stepping stones that allow perhaps a lead investigator to really put together this entire story. And so we are at the stage now where the rate at which this is happening is so fast that it's conceivable that a graduate student could carry a story to completion. Um, or, you know, if a student was in my lab and wanted to use that research to set up their own lab, I'd be very open to that possibility so they could sort of take it through to the... And most of the time, though, this is a really good experience for graduate students because they learn evolutionary biology. They learn a lot of uh, bioinformatics. This is a lot of... This is basically our, our toolbox, if you sort of compare to the paleontologists who have their brushes and, mic you know, magnifying glasses. Our toolbox are computers, algorithms, trying to excise. I mean, once a gene has been dead for 35 million years and has had that much mutation, it's a real, it, it, it's a science, but, it, you know, you really need to be uh, very well trained in multiple disciplines to essentially extract that information. And now virology, where you can basically go back and understand what, what was the sort of source virus? So we've actually been able to recreate uh, this virus that I mentioned that uh, entered the chimp and gorilla genome that's been extinct for 4 million years simply by using the information of these multiple dead copies in the genome and so essentially resurrecting the gene that we wanted to study from this dead extinct retrovirus. So that's almost at the point where if I was a graduate student starting off, you know, I won't mention how many years ago, but... Uh, that was almost science fiction, and this is the stuff we can do in a matter of a year now. So the rate of progress is uh, dramatic. The intellectual driving force behind uh, this is now completely unleashed, so we can sort of really think about challenging questions uh, which we would have been sort of daunted by in the past. So I think it's an exciting time to be a student. <laughs>